SPIFI Coalition, which is the Strategic Planning Initiative for Families and Youth, and we're clicking for each other, so I think we're going to point to each other every time we want clicking, um, so you can click. Next one. Wait, I didn't try. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So we're, we're going to also try to go kind of quickly, so I may skip some slides, so I'll skip our intro here and um, tell you just a little bit about our coalition. So Spiffy is a countywide coalition. Um, Hadley is one of the towns named in the grant that we get from the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. Um, and so we are a resource for um, you know, Hadley as well as um, a number of other towns and really we do the whole county. So, um, but we do have a special eye on Hadley and wanting to bring you resources. So um, we, um, we bring people together um, from all sectors of the community. Um, we have a school health task force and we have a laws and norms working group. And both of those task forces have a lot of strategies under them that um, are doing work to prevent alcohol, um, marijuana, opioid, you know, and other drug use. And we're also looking at sort of how trauma impacts um, people's lives and um, so we are in the, we're also in the process of um, organizing and helping to organize a group that's looking at trauma-informed communities. So. Um, so the framework that we use is based on risk and protective factors. Um, so you know some of the risk factors that um, face young people are you know um, family management issues. Um, they, um, you know, just income and poverty, um, um, a sense that it's not, you know, risky to use substances. Um, there's a whole host of sort of risk factors. And then there's a bunch of protective factors as well, being connected to your community, to your school, um, having peers that are um, doing positive behaviors, being recognized for your efforts and contributions to community and school and other things. And so, you know, we sort of try to bolster up those protective factors and reduce the risk factors. And we do this at all levels of the community, um, at the individual and peer level, to the family, to the school and um, community. And look at what are the risk factors and protective factors at each of those levels. Yeah. <laughs> And so part of the way that we measure some of the risk and protective factors and what's going on in our community is that we um, conduct a survey every two years um, throughout every school district in Hampshire County and Hadley included. Um, the data that I'm going to be showing you tonight is Hampshire County-wide data, but we do have data specifically on um, Hadley as well. Um, so in all, we surveyed over 3,000 students this past time. We'll be surveying again in the spring. Um, uh, in March, so, yep. And um, a lot of people say, well, kids are not honest on these surveys. They're not gonna tell you the truth, right? <laughs> and so we are like really pretty clear that as long as, you know, sometimes memory can affect everybody's survey taking. Like, what, did I do that how many times in the last year? I don't know. But in terms of actually lying on the survey, we have like all these ways of, um, I gotta look at my notes here, of um, double checking that. Um, we have an honesty question and um, national surveys show that when kids answer that they were not honest on the survey, then they probably weren't <laughs> and you throw that whole survey out. If someone says, well, I've never used um, heroin, but I used it 10 times in the last 30 days, then that whole survey gets thrown out. Um, and also we see like the, what's going on in Hadley is more or less the same as what's going on in Amherst and Northampton and East Hampton and you know each town might have its own flavor. We find that Volk schools tend to have higher chewing rates for chewing tobacco than tobacco, regular tobacco, because they need hands free for doing the trades. Um, so you might find that you know Amherst and Northampton might have a little higher marijuana than you know. But so you do find differences, but. For the most part, every question that we look at is more or less the same, school to school to school. 
So here's some trend data. So we've been collecting this data for a long time. And so I tried to color code these with alcohol being yellow, marijuana's green, prescription drugs are red. So as you go through these, you can kind of see that. And tobacco, cigarettes are blue. So between um, 2007 and 2017, you can see that alcohol has actually gone down a little bit from 48% of uh, students using in the past 30 days. So we don't even look at lifetime use that much because um, lots of students may try something once. But we do, past 30 days, a pretty good indicator that it's, that it's being used more regularly. Um, and down to 38% in 2017. Uh, marijuana, on the other hand, has gone up from 27% um, to 31% in 2017. Uh, tobacco has gone down 18% to 8, I mean 14% to 8, and then prescription drug misuse has gone down since um, 2007. Mm -hmm. Quick question, do you think that trend is because of legalization? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we didn't see a big spike um, when decriminalization happened, um, but we did start to see an uptick as, as more and more media attention was given to legalization. Yeah, and I think we'll expect it to continue to go up. Yeah. So, this, actually let's skip this one because you have this slide in yours. Um, so, we have here we are using lifetime use for e-cigarettes because we didn't ask this question prior to 2013. Um, we, we didn't ask 30-day use until 2000, I think, 17. So it just wasn't, it, because it was almost non-existent. <laughs> so this is to sort of show you that from, really from 2011 to 2017, there's been almost a 900% increase in e-cigarette use. And so from 2013 and to 2017, here 45% of 12th graders have ever tried e-cigarettes. So almost half. So a quick question yeah. about e-cigarette. So I'm really dumb about the, all this stuff. So an e-cigarette is basically it has nicotine in it, but it's not a regular cigarette, like old-time cigarette. It, it's right. More I mean, of a, Melinda is going to go through like every okay, last detail that. about that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it may contain nicotine, it may not, but usually you don't even know. It probably does because it's not very well regulated. Okay. Yeah, so when we look at past 30 day use of e-cigarettes, um, you can see there's the traditional cigarettes. And in 2017, um, this is 10th grade and 12th grade, with um, 10th being in the blue. Um, about 10% of 12th graders have used regular cigarettes in the past 30 days. 21% of 12th graders used e-cigarettes. And then I'm also gonna talk a little bit about marijuana use mixed in here, because I think we should also be a little bit alarmed at the marijuana use. Um, and you can see that over a third of 12th graders are using marijuana regularly. And that's um, um, higher than the national level by Quite a bit, <laughs> as you can see the little thing up above it. I have a question. Yeah. When is the survey performed? Because you're asking within the last 30 days. Right. So what you're getting is a snapshot. And if those kids right then, in that day, say, you know, and, and we time this so that it's not right after St. Patrick's Day or spring break, right. you know, we, we actually very intentionally time the survey not to be within 30 days of a, a special event. If there's a special event in a town that we don't know about, we'd like to, and then we make sure we add that as part of our analysis. Or even I think in summer mm -hmm. vacation, they yep. have more time versus just Yep, so we don't do it between 30 days within anything that happens like that. Yeah. Um, and so when we ask students, well, what substances have you banged? <laughs> um, we can see that um, most say, you know, it's still a majority, although just barely with the 12th graders, say they've never tried a vaping device. Um, most are using some kind of e-juice. And then about between 12, 12% so of 10th graders and 22% of 12th graders are vaping marijuana. And then um, with the tobacco is like dried 
leaf tobacco. That's not very popular anymore. Um, I don't know if it ever was that popular, but with a vaping device. And then some of them say something else, and then about 4% just say, I'm not even sure what I was vaping. And you know, I think that is the truth too. A lot of kids are sharing the vape devices and you know, there's no real standards in there. Um, when we ask teens um, how they're using marijuana, most say they're smoking it in a joint, a bong, a pipe, or a blunt. Um, you know, still about a quarter you know, of 12th graders are eating it in a candy or food or brownies. 17% um, say they vaped it, um, and that's of 12th graders. There's dabbing is also, you know, something that's increasing. It's a waxy substance that then gets burned. Um, drank it in a tea, there's a few, and used it in some other way. Yeah. Dabbing, it's like a, using, a, it's like a waxy substance that you use in a pipe. Yeah. It's super, hmm? super heated. Super heated, yeah. Um, next one is, um, so where teens are getting marijuana, most from a friend, same, it's the same kind of social access as we see with alcohol, um, including getting it from parents' homes and getting it with parents' permission and without parents' permission, um, getting it from a stranger or a dealer, from a family member, um, with someone else's medical card. I grew it, or someone in my family grew it, um, with my own medical card, I bought it at a store, and we put that in there as a um, baseline question, um, knowing that we're going to be, you know, wondering if we're going to see that go up, and then in some other way. Um, so one of the, like I said, one of the risk factors is that when young people think that something is not risky, then they're more likely to engage in that behavior. And when they think something is risky, they're less likely to. Likewise, when they think their family, if they think their parents think there's a big risk or a lot of harm or very wrong for them to do, then they're less likely to use. Then if their family members are sending them a message that it's not, ah, oh, it's no big deal, I'd rather have you do that than alcohol or something, you know, those kind of messages will actually increase the likelihood that young people would use. So you can see that they still think that cigarettes are pretty darn risky. You know, that, that message is through, it's gotten through. Um, but with e-cigarette use, almost half think that there's little or no risk. And then with marijuana, 70% of 12th graders think there's little or no risk. This is showing 30% that say there's great, um, moderate or great risk. But 70% say there's little risk or no risk. So it's, it's really something like as we're doing prevention work, that's like a really key piece that we need to try to figure out and get the message to young people. Um, <laughs> Oh, is that it? Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. think so, actually. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how to do that. Well, I, sorry, I don't know how to do that. that. I was just sitting there. And I you just take it. Yeah, sorry. Wait, that's okay. It could be it. We could end there. <laughs> that would be okay with me, too. So um, let me just see. I must have hit the button there by accident. Well, I'll, I'll sure. go through a few more. We have so much data. I don't want to bog you down too much, but Enjoy. let me know what you think. I mean, oh, so let's see. Um, this, this, okay. So I just, I also just wanted to show you that, like, we also ask young people, like, so now they think there's no risk associated with using marijuana, but 49% of those who do use marijuana say that they've had these negative outcomes, right? Feeling groggy, tired, and unmotivated. And we know that about marijuana, so that's not a huge surprise. But 39% um, say they have coughing and breathing problems as a result of their marijuana use. Um, difficulty remembering things, a third. So like at the same time, like this disconnect is there between really some pretty serious, you is know. Is a third of the ones the, who thought there was a risk or a third of? No, this is just all, all of all students who, used, who reported that they used marijuana in the past 30 days, so kind of regular users. What negative outcomes did you experience? And it's a check all that apply. So a third of them checked that they had difficulty remembering things. So it's funny that none of them yeah. 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 And so, <laughs> right, so you have difficulty remembering things.
things, but you're still fine at school. So again, there's some disconnects that I think we need to kind of connect the dots for, for kids, yeah. And um, let's see what else I have. Oh, driving, yeah. So um, while we're seeing a real decrease in riding and driving with a drunk driver, driving drunk or riding with a drunk driver, um, that really has gone down since 2011. But we're seeing this you know, pretty um, big increase in driving and riding, driving high and riding with a high driver. So this is another big issue that we're gonna have to be tackling. Um, and here's the clear family rules. So um, the blue is students who report that they have clear family rules about um, alcohol and marijuana. Actually, we just separated out the marijuana use. Um, and then those who used in the past 30 days. So when there are clear family rules um, and clear consequences and all of those things, those kids are less likely to use. Um, and here again, like when your parents think something is wrong, how wrong do your parents think it is for you to use cigarettes, e-cigarettes, marijuana, and alcohol? And this is divided by middle school and those whose parents say it's a little bit wrong or not wrong at all. And those kids that report that are much likely to be the user, the ones who are using on all drugs but particularly with the marijuana, too. Um, okay, let's skip this one, and we'll skip that one. So when we just sort of look at what can we do as a community, um, let me get my notes here. Um, really, policy is one of the biggest um, things that we can, is, is actually one of the most helpful things. and so. You know, we, I, I don't know exactly what Hadley's policies are in their Board of Health around um, cigarette use and vaping, and you may know more about Hadley's policies here, but um, most of the Boards of Health now have these really strong policies oh, yes. where, yeah, where you can't buy e-cigarettes that are flavored or flavored tobacco products unless it's a 21 plus store. So, um, like, that's a huge deterrent for youth access. And then we know that they can get them online and blah, 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 but just having those regulations in place sets a norm, both for adults and for youth, that people care in this community and that these are, you know, some of the ways that we're gonna limit it. Northampton just had a public forum around eliminating um, any tobacco and vaping in the downtown area with designated smoking areas. So there's a lot that we can do to shift these norms, and policy is really one of the most effective, low-cost ways of doing it. So as we move into the marijuana era, it's really on, on us all in our communities to find out what are the licensing boards doing, what is your social host agreement, and what are your boards of health doing to address some of the marijuana issues. So it's just something to keep an eye on. In schools, we have model school policies. We have copies of those here. If you want to bring them back to this school, we're happy to work, happy to work with schools to implement those. I think also is just understanding within the schools that um, you know, in, you know, the, the vaping has really brought attention to the fact that um, you know, where with some substance use, we might immediately go to suspension and you know, this is illegal and you know, that kind of thing, but it has brought, so many kids now are getting caught that it's raised an awareness about like, are there alternatives to suspension, especially with any substance use, there's a component of addiction and mental health and other things. And so how can we wrap around students in a way that's um, both holding a strong line and setting limits, but also um, working to support students. Um, if the school doesn't have an 84 chapter or a SAD chapter, these are ways that students can get involved and there's funding, um, if, if, but you need an adult leader usually to, to work on those, but. Uh, yeah. Is it? All right, well, this, that could be a good place to stop. <laughs> there was a, a slide on families. There actually is a slide on what can families do and um, underneath it is like a whole bunch of resources. And um, one of the ones that I really like, um, and there's a few copies on the table over there, but you can get this online. My slides have links to all the resources. There's a, a resource for cessation, which is um, where young people can actually call in 24 seven and get counseling with a, with a person on um, vaping and, and tobacco cessation without parent permission. 
And like that's, to me, that feels really key. So that's a great resource. Um, there's some Spanish language resources. And then this one right here has these, it really looks at sort of motivational interviewing as a technique. So how do you talk to kids first about like, well, what are you getting out of doing this? Like, what's the advantage to you? And maybe really being able to hear that it helps them concentrate or that they're worried about weight or some other issue and then working on getting at the bottom of that issue. But also, you know, it gives you like direct answers to, you know, when your teen says, would you rather I drink alcohol? Weed is so much safer, you know? And it gives you the, what, what do you say when they say that? And, you know, if your teen says, um, you know, marijuana is a plant, it's natural, how harmful could it, uh, you know, harm, harmful could it be? And then they give you the response. So this is a great resource. And um, there's also this thing called the Talk They Hear You app. And um, if you just Google Talk They Hear You app, it'll come up and you download it on your phone. And you can actually practice with an avatar using pretty realistic scenarios. There's one where the kid, the teen is like looking at their phone and talking about making a plan to bring a flask to a party while the parent is having this discussion with them about alcohol use. And so it's sort of like you go and you get a coach and what does the coach tell you to do and stuff like that. So. Those are some resources, and I'm gonna. If anyone has any questions about my presentation, otherwise I'll turn it over to Linda. Yeah. On November 9th, um, we have a professional development day at the Collaborative for Educational Services, and um, we actually are bringing in the catch catch my breath curriculum people, and they're going to do talk about this new curriculum that the state is behind and that is gonna be offered for free for schools because they're desperate for good curriculum yeah. at the school level. And, and what this Catch My Breath is, it's, it's a clearinghouse for health education and this is a four class health curriculum that a health teacher could give. And the curriculum's all right there for And they for have it for different age they groups. They have it, yeah, they do it um, age appropriate. So mm -hmm. it's like fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, and then eighth grade, and then five different, I think mm -hmm. maybe ninth and 10th and 11th and 12th. So we do have that um, as an offer, and CVS is underwriting it. It's completely true. Do you Well, it's brand, brand new. So, um, yeah, my husband's a teacher in Muslim. He's working with his, with his staff. Oh, good, good. But yeah, I saw that on the collaborative. Yeah, and we didn't even know at that point that this woman from um, the catch curriculum was going to be able to. She just emailed yesterday and said, yes, I'm going to come. And, and so it was just going to be our thing, but we're, you know, plus some more school policy stuff. But we're going to really focus on some of that curriculum stuff now. So yeah. One of the things that uh, the, the, the program I work for really believes in is that youth benefit much more from a longer conversation with a trusted adult, someone they already know, versus a speaker to just come in for one day and be like, hey, you know, da, da, da. We also uh, are very wary that we don't want to be the ones who are like, this is an e-cigarette, and trigger the curiosity about yeah. yeah. for 10 bucks. Yeah. 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 Or the dollar. <laughs> yeah. We really, yeah. Want, we really want the message yeah. to come from the right person yeah. in the right way, knowing that group or that child, you know, in, in, in an important way. I, I think your most powerful slide, I know nothing about any of this, but was that vaping is not water vapor, it's yes. gas. Mm -hmm. yes. That to me yes. said yeah. it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that if I were into this, I think that would stop. Yeah. Here at least mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we have a colleague who, because um, I was talking about this with my people over at my program, and it's sort of like, would you spray hairspray in your mouth? Of course you wouldn't. You know? And this is. Aerosolized chemicals, just like that. And the other thing that's disturbing is the that the content of all of these is not tested. That's mm -hmm. the other part because yeah. you have no idea. Yeah. Like if they get it that cheap, you don't even know where they're manufacturing yeah. stuff. So yeah. mm -hmm. if, if they're making something cheap, yeah. are they throwing some weird stuff yeah. in there? Yeah. I mean, I talked with scary. one like um, one yeah, of the really people scary. that's on the South Hadley Coalition Prevention Coalition. Um, the brother had a vape shop in Holyoke, and she said, you know. Well, he tells me he drives to Boston or New York, meets the container at the shipyard, and they unload these, you know, boxes of e-juice, and then he can repackage it and put it in whatever and sell it, you know, or just sell, or he, he can get some there in smaller, but it's completely unregulated, you know? The FDA is inching, they really are. They, they, and it's kind of interesting, the tactic, because they're really going after the, the biggest share of the market first, which is kind of surprising. There was, it was supposed to be that they were going to inspect all 
the products, both liquids and the machines. By August 2018, everything had to be submitted, but that got extended. So um, hopefully mm -hmm. they'll really step up and, and get that online. Unfortunately, I missed our town meeting because we had a special meeting and it was all a lot about marijuana and mm -hmm. selling it. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't had a chance to watch watch the results of it yet. But will marijuana places like if, they, if that does come to town, will they also be able to sell vape stuff as well? Yeah, that's what no, um, they they won't well, they won't be able to sell. I don't believe they can sell dual products. So they can't sell alcohol and marijuana and nicotine and marijuana. Um, they will be a 21 and only stores. Um, and there's a lot of limits on what kind of advertising can be done. And they no gummy product. They, well, there's gummy products, but they can't be shaped as animals. Um, there's the signage can't have any cartoons or anything like that. No pot leaves. Um, so the state has done quite a bit to limit all of that, but I think what people don't get is that even though there's a few ma and pa shops that want to open locally, there's this, the way the state law is written, there's no division between producers, like growers, manufacturers, you know, um, distributors and sellers. And you can own the whole potato, and there's a bunch of huge industry people waiting to take that market. So while small people may you know, be able to get a niche in there, we, it's going to be a lot like big tobacco, big alcohol. And it, had we not limited anything, there would be all the gummies and the this and the that. It's only through regulation that the industry will contain itself. And it, they're not gonna just be out of the kindness of their heart or you know, something like, or we're you know, still hippies and we wanna do this the right way. It's, not what this industry is about. It, it needs to be regulated. Um, you know, yeah. And, and, um, just back to vaping for one mm -hmm. second. Um, I just want to show you some of the materials. So I have here, you can take them, or they're, they're, if you were so nice, you put them online, you can download them and print them yourself. Um, frequently asked questions about vaping. This is a four pager that's really good. It's this really is the best. Okay. The four is pager is the best. So, yeah. yeah. And, and then the village book has permission to scan them in and put them on the website as is. If yes. Yes. Yep. And they're online, so you can just download them oh, without yes. scanning them. And this is the one how to talk to your, your kids. Well, I don't do that, that one. one. I do that flyer. But, um, but also, if you want more information, um, we'll as I said, CDC them. has a bunch. Uh, Get Outraged has a bunch that's really, really good. But also, way back in 2016, the last Surgeon General, right before he, he left uh, his office, did a, a big research into this. And this is 2016, so before we had Juul and everything else. And there's still up, up online is this Know the Risks, and it talks about, gives some information for parents about vaping. And he was amazing because it, it's yeah, nothing's much has changed except for the shape. Um, but included in it, it's a 100-page report, you're not going to read that, but there's a nice, really nice summary. Um, it's called The Fact Sheet. It's a two-page summary that just has some really straight info about what this stuff is um, and what we know and what we know. You know, and I, I have, like, the, that and the four pagers sitting in my car, you know, and my kids are used to having me having all that kind of material, but then we take friends to, you know, sports games, and they're like, you know, it's like it's it's a conversation starter. You know, it's like what's this doing here? You know, but yeah, yeah, and yeah, and one of the nice things. I mean, I'm jumping around. I thought with the catch curriculum too, because so many youth are vaping, and those who don't want to vape, then it's a difficult situation for them. And mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of try this, try this. Well, what's up? And catch curriculum also, I think, deals with that, which mm -hmm. is really nice. Yeah, all those refusal it, skills it, and yeah. things like that. It, bolsters kids mm -hmm. in lots of different ways. And there is the Stanford School of Medicine. If you look up Stanford um, e-cigarette toolkit, the only thing that makes me a little hesitant about promoting it, although I've looked through it and it's like a rabbit hole. You can go into what are parents, you can go into eight-week curriculum for teachers. It's, you know, and you just go deeper and deeper and deeper into these like links. But it is this, it is where Jewel comes out of. They were Stanford graduates. And so I'm kind of like, hmm, but but it's a pretty good resource too. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.